From Calexico to none of it. From the Aleutian Islands to Newfoundland through New Hampshire and Indiana. This is the Dynasty Pulse. Producer! Welcome to the Dynasty Pulse with Grindberg and Biggs. Let me check my notes real quick. I am Biggs. He is Grindberg. We are part of the Fantasy Football Advice Network and the Undroppables and Fantasy Football Plus on the YouTubes. I don't know why I said the FFAN part. That's our other show. Um, I am dumb. <laughs> a lot. Uh, today, we are talking advanced metrics. We are talking them with our special guest. Don't look, don't look, don't look at the overlay. Don't look at the overlay. No! It's a secret. Don't look at the overlay. We're talking advanced metrics with our, whoa. How'd that Chelsea happen? on the ball. Look at that. Schultze. What kind of magic was that, producer? <laughs> uh, you got to get yourself off he, mute. He's on mute. Okay. Uh, we right, we, we yeah, have a producer, yeah, by on, the way. Second, um, chance, second chance. We got a special guest today. To ask, you probably can't afford it. Oh, that's why I'm not the producer. Um, we, we got a special to guest today. We are talking advanced metrics with none other than Ryan Heath from Fantasy Points. Producer! Oh, that shit goes hard. <laughs> hard, 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 hard. I welcome like here Ryan. with yeah, that's quite at the welcome. Ryan J <laughs> underscore Heath. Yeah. From Fantasy Points. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing great, guys. Excited to get in, talk about some nerdy advanced metrics. One of, <laughs> one of my favorite <laughs> things to do. Yeah. Um before we get started, let me ask you a question. How does it make you feel every time you hear some uh, former professional player talk about um, stats don't tell you everything. It's all about the eye test and you you can have, you, you know, you and your mom's basement and your underwear can't tell me that um, what I see on the field is, is how, how does that make you feel inside? <laughs> well, there, there's like, there's two wolves inside of me, of course, right? There's, there's the one wolf that is like, I, I know so much better than anybody who dares to question me. There's always that wolf. But in reality, I understand that everybody comes at this game with a very different perspective. I come at it largely from a very analytically numbers driven perspective. And the reason for that is not because I think the analytics or the numbers or whatever way of analyzing football is better than everything else, but just because that's what I'm good at. And that's what I know I can bring to the table. So that's go. how I try to look at it. I, I try to avoid like the wars of what is the correct way to talk about this game. Right. See, I, I come from it. I, I originally come from the world of baseball and I was a, a ball player and also a writer. Uh, I, I was in Sabre. I got into advanced analytics. I am of the money ball generation, uh, which wasn't about analytics. It was about market inefficiencies in team construction. But one of the things is from the on-field perspective, I can look at a guy and I can tell if he's been coached. I can tell if he has talent. I can tell those things. But the way that I frame it, especially with analytics, is that we are dealing with the top 1% of athletes. And a lot of times you can see the same two people with the eye test doing the same thing, but their numbers on paper don't match up. How do you explain those differences? That's where analytics comes in. Of course, I can look at Max Crosby and tell you that he's an elite pass rusher because the results play out on the field. But where do you find the splitting of the hairs, the differences between him and TJ Watt or him, him and Miles Garrett? You have to find them in the advanced analytics. And that's where you come in. Yeah. And, and one of the big things that I like to see is some of these metrics that we're that we're going to talk about today is going to underline some of the factors that we need to be looking at as breakouts you know how do we identify a breakout and how what they've done in the past can lead to that breakout success and 
some of the situations that some of these wide receivers in particular are going to be in that we're going to talk about today uh, are in positions to break out. And, uh, you know, some of the metrics that you've discovered, especially with your first down per route run, is going to really identify some of these breakouts uh, on the next level. So I'm really excited to get into this. Uh, you know, let's start with the quarterbacks, if anything, you know, so there's a metric here that, uh, you know, we, you talked about in one of your articles, and that is fantasy points per dropback. Do you want to talk about, uh, you know, our guests and everybody listening in, what exactly is fantasy points per dropback and, and, and how, how it's defined and, and how you calculate it? Can I guess first? Uh, it's how many points a quarterback yeah. scores every time they drop back. Exactly. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> but it accounts for throwing the ball and potentially running it. Absolutely, yes. Yes! Nailed yeah, it. You did. And, I mean, that really is kind of the magic of, not that there's magic to any of these stats, but that's the magic to that stat is it incorporates everything that we care about for fantasy football. Uh, I, I mean, we... I would say 10 years ago, we had kind of a problem in the fantasy community of being unwilling or unable to properly account for just how valuable rushing production is out of quarterbacks. Now I think we have kind of advanced beyond that. All of the like heavy rushing quarterbacks get mm -hmm. drafted very highly in, in all formats. We, we figured that one out, but fantasy points for drop back rather than having to think of in like a binary way of is this quarterback a runner or a passer? It just puts it all together in exactly how many fantasy points the running or the passing gets the QB, divides it by their total volume, their dropbacks. And it turns out when we do that, that is the most predictive stat of the next season's fantasy points per game for quarterbacks. So part, part of the reason for that is that QB is a really, really hard position to evaluate from a numbers perspective. So of course the us using fantasy points and dividing it by an equalizing volume stat is going to be much better than at really anything else numerically. Uh, but it, it's kind of what we have to work with. And I, I guess my only other big point about it is unlike every other position in fantasy football quarterback is very much an efficiency driven position. So it, you might think uh, that it's a bit odd that what's essentially an efficiency st stat per dropback is what I care about most for quarterbacks. But look, a quarterback, in order to get volume that we care about, in order to get near the red zone, to have opportunities to throw touchdowns and score fantasy points, they have to make it down the field, right? <laughs> and the quarterbacks who do that are the good quarterbacks. They are the efficient quarterbacks. So it, right. it's kind of flipped on its head where we care more about efficiency at the QB position than volume, at least in any way that we can easily measure it. So so essentially what what we're trying to do is figure out uh, everybody knows that Lamar Jackson can rush for a thousand yards. And then we see his fantasy points per game and there's a direct correlation there. Well, he throws the ball a lot and he throws some touchdowns and he runs the ball a lot and he rushes for lots of yards and touchdowns we can tell that he's going to be in the elite levels of fantasy scoring, but it's really trying to pull out those Sam Howells who winds up 14 weeks as QB four to start the season. Where is he getting those points from? If he's throwing so many interceptions, et cetera, trying to glean possible breakouts out of guys that aren't necessarily in the conversation as a Russian quarterback, but do bring enough of that upside to kind of, hit in your model is that does that sound fair to fair to say yeah absolutely and that those are it, it's so yeah kind of as you're getting at i think it's not surprising to see heavy rushing quarterbacks do really well in fantasy points per drop back or in whatever stat yeah josh allen and lamar jackson and jalen hurts are all near the top no one should be surprised by that but yeah when you do see especially the younger quarterbacks uh who are primarily pocket passers doing well in this stat, that's a really good signal that they're, they're probably pretty talented. So that would be Jordan Love from last year. He was top eight in fantasy points per drop back. Uh, CJ Stroud, top 11. Brock Purdy actually ranked second. I don't I don't know that I believe that's going to yeah. fully sustain, but it's a, it's a good example of Brock Purdy's just 
I I don't even know what to call it yeah. factor when he's on the field. Yeah. Well, I was going to get into that because, you know, he he ranked second in this metric last year. And there's a couple other quarterbacks that that, that made this list that I, I want to kind of, you know, dig a little bit deeper in. But Brock Purdy was the biggest one because he's not being valued in many circles as a top 10 quarterback. And he finished in this metric as the second overall, you know, quarterback in this metric fantasy points per drop back. And he's not a rushing quarterback. So that is like. It's bringing all this together. Is it more because of his situation, because he's putting into an offense that is set up to succeed with all the weapons around him? Um, is it like, why is Purdy so successful in this situation? Because he's not a rushing quarterback either. Yeah. If, no. I, if I can Sorry, jump in real quick and, and posit a, a, a hypothesis, <laughs> um, maybe it's because when he does run with the ball, he, he has big gains. So his rushing yards per attempt when he does tuck the ball and run is, is I would, I would imagine, I would bet that it's larger than some of the quarterbacks that are running RPOs um, just because of that's, that's kind of how the field opens for him. Does that sound close? I actually have no idea what Brock Purdy's rushing efficiency is <laughs> yes. like. I'm gonna yeah, do not have that pulled up. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have to take a look at that. Um, but yeah, I think with him, it does come down to. I, so I personally hate saying that X coach or X offensive coordinator has like a magical factor that makes all of the players on the field better. I do. If that exists in the NFL, it is with Kyle Shanahan. So that that is certainly a piece of it. In addition to that, the just the yards after catch that it, the that this 49ers yes. offense is able to generate is unbelievable. Uh, and even beyond that, if like we at fantasy points data, we will chart uh, all sorts of stats for quarterbacks. We have uh, accuracy. Uh, so if you put every quarterback's accuracy percentage on a graph, and compare it to their yards per attempt. Brock Purdy was not that accurate of a quarterback last year. He easily led the league in yards per attempt. So yes, part of it is the weapons he has. Part of it is the crazy magic stuff of the scheme. And part of it is just that San Francisco is a lower volume passing offense, but when they do throw, they really make the most of it more so than any other team. Uh, yeah, because they're... They're, sorry to interrupt, but they're, they're 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 low percentage passes that create a lot of yards after the catch. And these guys like Christian McCaffrey, who's catching passes out of the backfield, like a Debo Samuel, who's making a lot of yards after the catch, and a guy like you know Brendan Ayuk, who's got a really good yards per route run and a very very he's he's on the elite spectrum of the first down per route run as well. So we'll probably get in a little bit more about Brandon Ayuk, and maybe that's a huge factor in why Brock Purdy has that success in this metric. I was going to say, stop interrupting our guest, Mike. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, you can see a correlation between a, a wide receiver rooms, collective yak per reception and the yards per. Cause that, I, that was the first thing that kind of seemed intuitive to me was that, well, maybe it's receivers that have big yak who are going to be helping the quarterbacks. Yeah. Yards per drop back. Yeah, uh, it's certainly part of it. I will also say though that Yak from is also partially on the quarterback. I, he has to place the ball correctly to give the receiver the chance to even turn up field. So, it as with any of these stats, it's extremely difficult to isolate one thing to one position and say this is the stat that the quarterback owns that completely shows how he plays versus any of his wide receivers. Uh, we, we get run into a similar thing uh, with something like catchable target rate where receivers either get open and get a lot of catchable targets or their QBs throw a lot of catchable targets. It, it's kind of both ways. And I think it's the same with the act. So I, so, I so want to give Carson party credit Beck, as well. You're saying Carson Beck is QB two in the rookie class next year. Yeah. <laughs> and with, the, right. with this rookie class, like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move into the wide receivers, I'm going to touch base on two quarterbacks that landed in the top 10 in this metric and are now on the same team. And that's Russell Wilson and that's Justin Fields. Now, both of these guys landed in a situation where I think the Steelers 
need that upgrade at quarterback. They did really good things there. Roman Wilson is coming in, and they have George Pickens, who Biggs has already flag planted as his guy for 2024. What are your thoughts on this uh, quarterback situation in Pittsburgh? And uh, do you think it's going to be a Russell Wilson show throughout the whole season? Or do you think Justin Fields pushes him? Because, you know, in this metric, Justin Fields finished seventh and Russell Wilson finished 10th. And they were both on different teams last year. So, you know, coming into a new offense, how was this metric transfer over into quarterbacks with new teams? Well, so I do think the first thing just in terms of fields versus wilson arthur smith is an extremely stubborn person so i i don't know which side the fan base is pro this fan base will probably end up on the side of wanting to see justin fields uh so i i could certainly see some more sparring between arthur smith and the steelers fan base on that uh with wilson playing deep into the season that would be my expectation um but as far as wilson himself I do for him. I do attribute a lot of the efficiency to Sean Payton. I understand that it's very easy and funny to make fun of Sean Payton nowadays um, with some of the stuff he says at like in his post draft pressers. But I do think the guy legitimately knows how to get the most out of very mid quarterbacks for lack of a better term. I, we, we've seen all sorts of guys succeed in that system. Uh, so I, I would put, put Wilson kind of more in the category of I, I think the situation was pumping up his fantasy points per drop back last year. So if you're asking for a fantasy football take from me, then yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm taking fields late and hoping that he starts like, I, I think that's a, in dynasty. I think that's a reasonable thing to do right now at his cost. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think this means that Russell Wilson has like untapped upside or anything like that. So so that kind of leads me down a couple different paths. Um, so thanks, Mike, for um, twisting up my brain. Um, OK, so you, you just he the reason I say that is because Mike brought up two fantastic examples of guys that um, that I've I've kind of focused a little bit on in the last couple of years. Number one is Russell Wilson and his transition to the Steelers, where you, you talked about catchable ball rate. His catchable ball rate was worlds better than the combination of Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph last year, which signals an uptick for the Steelers offense with Russell Wilson under center. And then I look at Justin Fields, who I've, you know, obviously in, in trying to do my due diligence in dynasty leagues, um, trying to talk myself out of going for a guy who, like you said, ranked seventh in, in uh, points per drop back. So what I'm trying to do in my brain is square DVOA, where Justin Fields is consistently in the bottom five of the league, which is more of a of an in real life stat versus fantasy points per drop back, which I've always known fields is going to be in the elite level at. So where does an NFL team find that square where, okay, the guy's not efficient. He's not very good, but fantasy wise, he's, he scores lots at of least. fantasy points per game. Like, cause if he, if, if his, if he's not uh, analytically in real life, very good, he's not going to keep his job even if he's elite at a fantasy level, similar to my bringing up Sam Howell QB four in the first 14 weeks last season, scuttled by his team for inefficiency and, you know, a, a propensity to throw the ball to the other jerseys. Like wh where, where are we finding that balance in looking forward to next year and, and figuring out who is who is going to be the quarterback who are going to be the quarterbacks that stick around yeah so in dynasty when yeah when we're talking about who is sticking around who has value insulation the first thing you said is by far the most important is in real life do these teams view this quarterback as a real okay. starter in the league and i I do not, I think it's very clear that that's not the case with Justin Fields at this point. Yeah, I would not contest that at all. But I will say any game that Justin Fields starts in fantasy, he is project, he needs to be projected as a top 12 quarterback easily. And that, that has been the case pretty much his entire career anytime he's been allowed to trot out there and start. So if, 
is that rich at his dynasty ADP potentially, but I, I can understand wanting to take the shot there. Uh, I don't think he's like a priority rebuilding team target or anything like that though. Sounds a lot like my number one handcuff last season, Marcus Mariota. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All right. Just let's in case let's move on to the wide receivers and there's two very important metrics and you know, you, you just, put out two articles in the last month or so one being yards per route run. And the last one being uh first downs per route run, they kind of have some correlation to each other. Uh, you discovered essentially the first down per route run. And that's a huge metric as far as, you know, predicted solidifying long-term success first, uh, you know, yards per route run is more for predicting, you know, breakout stuff. Uh, I love this metric. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, first down per route run and, and, and you know, a little bit more to our viewers on, on what it is and, and how you, it's easy to calculate, but a little bit more about it. Yeah, absolutely. So first downs, first, we need to view first downs as this is a measure of skill, right? Much like a receiver gaining yards is a measure of skill, gaining a first down is a measure of skill. Divided by routes run, there you go. You have a pretty good efficiency stat. And at the receiver position, I always say the first stat you should look at to get an understanding of a player is target share. First downs per outrun is actually more predictive of the next season's fantasy points per game than target share is. So if we're getting above target share and predictiveness, I start paying attention. I get pretty interested. So yeah, much like yards per outrun, as you might be used to, first downs per outrun, measure of efficiency, measure of skill for a wide receiver. What gets really interesting is when you compare the two stats, because they, they are very similar, they are highly correlated, but we have guys every single year who are much better in one stat than the other. So for example, if a receiver is way better in yards per outrun than they are in first downs per outrun, that's a sign that a lot of that yards per out run figure is fueled by usually big plays because if they're gaining a lot more yards than you'd expect for their amount of first downs, it's because of big plays essentially. So that can signal that perhaps what they were doing wasn't sustainable. Uh, it, it can be in a few different ways. It, it can be like an archetype thing. So it, you might see, field stretchers like Rashid Shahid fall into this bucket. Uh, or or you might see guys like, th this is more of a positive example, but D Debo Samuel just with insane yards after the catch efficiency falling into a bucket like this. Uh, so kind of no matter how they get there, it's important to look at guys who don't do as well in first downs per outrun compared to yards per outrun and say, well, well, how did they do this? And do I think it's repeatable? And if not, you would need to expect them to be less efficient in the following season. How does it translate from NCAA into the NFL? So not super well from what, from what I can tell. Uh, and, and I mean, this, this is the case with a lot, a lot, a lot of stats. Uh, it, it's very hard to find one particular stat that translates super well from college to pros. It's really important to control for level of competition for conference. There, there's a lot of things going on there when, when it comes to a lot uh, more just, variables. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, yeah, the rookie scouting, I don't personally do a ton of it. I rely a lot on Scott Barrett at fantasy points that that is super his domain. Uh, he thinks yards per outrun is meaningfully better than first downs per outrun when we're talking about rookies. Uh, and, and I am not one to argue with him there. Yeah. I think, I think uh first down per route run is, 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 is more for a guy that is not ready to break out and, you know, uh, yards per route run is, is, is an addictive stat for somebody that you want to see break out. And I think that that is, uh, is, is a pretty good, uh, you know, separation between the two stats. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, well said. All right. Forget everything I ever said about Lad McConkey. <laughs> hey, I, I, are you, are you got, are you anti Lad McConkey? Where, where no, no, I don't I am, know what I the 
pro Ladd McConkey. Okay, he, good. No, I'm pro Ladd McConkey too. Okay, good. He he had an, an elite first downs per route run in college. He was third in the 2024 class. Troy Franklin was fourth. I love both of those guys. Franklin has the the bigger bigger difference between yards per route run uh, and first downs per route run, indicating he he was a, a lot more of a deep target. Um, but Ladd McConkey, especially against zone. Combining his yak, his missed tackles forced, his first downs per route run, um, he he was second in an aggregated collection of of those statistics, only behind Malik Neighbors last year. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. fell off a lot because of his yak and his missed tackles forced, which means that he was catching the ball in traffic a whole lot, and uh, don't know why. Um, maybe a difference in the scheme or what have you, but uh, certainly he was, he was catching the ball in different situations than neighbors or, or McConkey were, but McConkey was like right up there with, with those guys, like, you know, Romo Dun- better than Romo, Romo Dunes a, um, and that, that has carried me very far in, in my rookie drafting so far. Yeah, no, I do think it matters. And especially in a wide receiver class like this one where, I honestly, after the top three, a lot of these analytical profiles leave a lot to be desired. I'm happy to just zero in on one thing about a player. If there's something I can latch on to and kind of kind of narrativize everything else away. So with Lad McConkey, it's yeah, he wasn't on the field super regularly. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, they, they rotate their wide receivers a lot there. Uh, they were destroying teams, et cetera, et cetera. But when he was on the field, when we jump into the per route stats, yeah, he looks amazing. So it, in a class like this, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. My only fear is what just trying to audit my own thinking. I understand that Puka Nakua was kind of a similar, you could get to Puka Nakua in a similar way last year. I, mm-hmm. I don't think I'm just pattern matching to Puka Nakua. But I do think if Puka Nakua didn't happen, I would be less confident in jumping into the per route stuff mm-hmm. with Lat McConkey. So that th- that's like my only hesitation. But yeah, I, I mean, McConkey is my rookie wide receiver for. So how much do you think Puka happening uh, had to do with Cooper Cup not being on the field and and Nakua's targets target share spiking? when Cooper cup wasn't around, which seems to be, I mean, his, his target share dropped off significantly when cup was around some of the, what made Puka so huge was his 20 targets and third, or he had 35 targets in his first two games as a rookie, which is unheard of. Um, yes, he was, he was very good and very efficient throughout the whole season, but if he hadn't had the first four weeks that he had, he'd have been a top 12, top 15 guy and wouldn't have been the Puka Nakua that everybody thinks that he is, right? So where does that kind of fall in? I mean, I don't know, man. If you take if you remove any player's best handful of games in a season, then they're, they're going to look a lot worse. He was still out producing Cooper Cup when they were on the field together. I think he's really good. And, and look... Yes, you can say there there was a total target vacuum here at the beginning of the year with Cup injured, and that that is true. But you would if you think a player is good, you would want him to step in and take advantage of that target vacuum in the exact way that Puka Nakua did. So, sure. yeah, I, it doesn't really give me any sort of pause. I, I think Cup is physically declining a little bit right now. Um, so yeah, I I am. Very much in on Puka. I'm I'm buying all all the hype and all the Kool Aid with him. Now you say that, but what I hear is Biggs, you're cherry pick cherry picking to create fade content for a show topic. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would never I would never uh, accuse you of doing such uh, a thing. So I got one more question about the ride receivers before we move on to the running backs. Okay, right, and this one here I've been salivating on asking you is because there's a guy that opt out on this chart for yards per route run and if it's indicative of future success in the nfl we're talking about a guy that is a second year player dontavian wicks who performed really really well in this metric and uh if this is indicative of future success 
Is he a guy that, uh, you know, he's being steamed up in a lot of circles. I heard Matt Harmon talking about him in perception reception. Uh, you know, uh, JJ Zacharyson had a topic on him. So, you know, an analytic guy, a film guy, they're both really on top of this. And then, you know, having this metric here, plain as day, is Don Tavian Wicks a guy that as a dynasty manager, we should be all in on? Yeah, I think we should, uh, but it just just me- depends what we mean by all in. So yeah. I'm happy to trade away my late seconds for Dontavian Wicks, and you can get that done in a lot of leagues. We can see that from the ADP and the trade data. But there, there. I mean, there are certainly leagues that are very far into the Twitter bubble where you need to pay like an early second for Dontavian Wicks. I'm not doing that. Look. Only He only had six games last year where he was over a 50% route share. Those were mostly the games that Christian Watson was out. Is he kind of a fancy handcuff to Christian Watson? Yeah, potentially. But look, when he got on the field, he was top 15 in first downs per route run. Even from the outside, he did incredibly well in both yards per and first downs per route run. So... I, I'm all about it. I, I actually talked to Matt Harmon about him a couple of days ago, and yeah, he gets, get also was giving glowing praise. So yeah, when I mean, when the film and the analytics align on a player, I certainly get even more excited about that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I am trying to still buy him in Dynasty, happy to draft him in best ball, all formats, et cetera. Yeah. And then and to add to that... Christian Watson... Follow at Ryan J underscore Heath on Twitter. Um, real quickly, I want to bring Schultz in. Uh, Schultz, are you seeing a theme here? Uh, does this seem like uh, Biggs and Grinberg are trying to like justify their hot takes and their content um, by bringing on an analyst and making him answer questions the way that they want them to be answered to justify their hot takes and content creation? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Schultz. <laughs> That's our producer, Schultz, for the assist there. And uh, I wanted to get into another road receiver just before we move on because it's piggybacking off that. And Jaden Reed, who's a guy that is, you know, similar profile, people say, to Debo Samuel, who doesn't, you know, fare well in these metrics. And Jaden Reed, also not a guy that has fared super well in these metrics. And he's a guy that, you know, has busted through Debo style. And Debo has kind of put this metric kind of as an outlier do you think Jaden Reed is an outlier in this metric as well or is it going to be somebody that because Don Tavian Wicks is you know so efficient in these metrics he's going to be garnering some of that 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 cloud well so I mean if if Don Tavian Wicks is taking away from anybody I hope to god it's Romeo Dobbs (laughs) and it it's likely to be either Watson or Dobbs just based on the usage Reed very clearly had that slot role locked down. Um, But that is kind of my concern with Reed is, look, if he is going to be a complete NFL wide receiver, why is Romeo Dobbs keeping out of (laughs) keeping him out of two wide receiver sets? Right. So that's kind of my pause with him. I mean, efficiency wise, yes, Reed was fairly good, a lot better in yards per outrun than in first downs per outrun. So that can give you a bit of a hint that maybe what he did last year wasn't entirely sustainable. Uh, He needs to earn more routes, more volume in order to take that next step forward, in my opinion. Uh, But I I mean, there are people who think he can do that. We we've already name dropped Matt Harmon. He, he is into Jaden Reed believes he can win, go and win on the outside. So I'm open to it. It's just that Reed is priced up very considerably higher than all of these other exciting young Packers wide receivers. So it's hard for me to get as many shares of him as I would be of Watson and of Wicks. My concern there with him is that he scored a lot of touchdowns last year and touchdown is not a very, you know, indicative, you know, stat that is going to be, you know, correlating the next year and with Christian Watson back potentially healthy with his hamstrings that could deter uh, a red zone target like you know Jaden Reed has been I mean they're they're gonna find ways to get him the ball if he's that talented but just just some some you know red flags to be putting up there with such a young team that so many variables in that offense and uh, I'm excited to see what Jordan Love has on the slate for 2024. 
kind of a similar thing happened to Christian Watson the year before. And maybe Dontavian Wicks is the, the touchdown leader this year or Luke Musgrave, or, I mean, there's, there's a ton of mouths to feed in green Bay and they're all, they're all pretty good. Um, as somebody who is a, a majority shareholder in Jaden Reed, um, I'm scared. I'm very scared. <laughs> and the reason that his value is so high is because those of us who were in on him big in the rookie drafts got him at huge value. And based on his season last year, we're not giving him up for very, for, for little. We're like, we're asking a lot for him. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, if you can have Jaden Reed because I'm scared, but uh, I'm going to justify my asking price based on the season that he had last year. Yeah. That's a hard place to be in with, with entering second year wide receivers who kind of broke out with their value, like Puka Nakua. Um, Puka Nakua is valued way higher than Jaden Reed. And he should be because he had a much, much better year, but the guys that were, that were taking him in the fourth and fifth rounds of their rookie drafts are getting him off the waiver wire. Now they're looking at it like, okay, now you want to come get this top 10 receiver. It's going to cost you a first round draft pick. It's going to cost you, you know, a first round, first round pick plus, um, and it just kind of like it skews the dynasty values a little bit, especially when you're talking about first and second year wide receivers. You need to kind of have a few more years. Yeah, not to bring us off topic, but I, I've had this experience with Kyle Pitts for my entire pretty much career playing <laughs> dynasty is whenever when you look at where Pitts is going in startups, it's like, oh, OK, awesome. Yeah, I'll get on. I'll get in on Kyle Pitts at those prices. But anybody who has Pitts in an established dynasty league that they have almost always been holding him since they yeah. took him at 101 or 102 in the rookie draft that year. And that, yeah, I, I think if, the, if there's any player that people really anchor to and w will not accept quote unquote market prices for it is Kyle Pitts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So we're going to move on to the running backs and you had two articles in the last month as well uh, that kind of, you know, it struck me as gold. And the first one uh, had kind of some analytics versus, you know, uh, missed tackles for us per touch. And then the next one is weighted opportunity. And then you also, uh, you know, piped in on regression too. So these are two articles that you got to see on fantasy points. Uh, you know, Ryan is uh, a, a leader in some of these articles and uh, these metrics that he's broken down, it puts it in layman's terms for some of us that, aren't as intellectual as Ryan is and uh, he puts it right into our terms, but tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, missed tackles for us per touch and, and how that correlates to fantasy points, but also then deep into like your, your last article, which is the most important one in my opinion is the, uh, you know, weighted opportunity there. Sure. I I love being called an intellectual over, <laughs> over football numbers. That's just very, <laughs> that's just very funny to me. Um, A statistical but, sophisticate. Yeah. <laughs> sure. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, missed tackles force per touch, very popular stat that people like to cite a lot. I've noticed, I think most people use it incorrectly. So if a, if, excuse me, if a running back is very good in MTF per touch, that does not mean that they're going to get a bunch more volume next year or that they're going to score a bunch more fantasy points next year. That is not how it works. Missed tackles force per touch, not predictive of fantasy points in the following season. Not at least not nearly as much as volume stats. But what we can understand from missed tackles force per touch is because it is one of the most stable running back efficiency stats. Um, and, and that's true in the pros. That is true from college to pros. Guys who force a lot of missed tackles generally tend to do so throughout their entire career. That is just how it seems to work, especially compared to other running back efficiency stats, which is, is generally a rough scene. So guys that are good in MTF per touch, if they have a situation change, if they get more volume, then we can project and say, okay, he's probably going to be successful with this opportunity. But it it doesn't go the other way around. It's it's not Jaleel McLaughlin forced a lot of missed tackles per touch last year. Therefore, he's going to get a bunch more volume and be great. It's, oh, the Broncos absolutely love throwing to their running backs. It's kind of a quagmire uh, behind Javante Williams. Is Javante Williams even good? There could be a lot of opportunity in this backfield. Who would succeed with it? Jaleel McLaughlin looks like he would. 
So that that's kind of what's important with MTF per touch. And what I guess what's much more direct for our running back stat is weighted opportunity, incredibly predictive of fantasy points in the following hmm. season. That's because weighted opportunity is just a volume stat that properly accounts for the value of every different type of touch. So running backs on average will score a lot more fantasy points on a target than they will on a carry about three times more in PPR leagues on average. The same goes for inside or outside of the red zone. Uh, you would much rather have a handful of touches in the red zone than a bunch of empty calorie touches on your team's own 20. Uh, so that's all that weighted opportunity really is, is it just properly weights the value of every single touch. It is one of the most highly correlated running back stats to fantasy points per game in the following season. And I think it's really important running back is a volume driven position so that your case for or against a player can absolutely start with, did they get the volume? Did they get the weighted opportunities last year? Mm, so... <clears throat> talking about green bay again um are we in or out on josh jacobs yeah so jake jacobs <laughs> kind of i love that i just laid out my whole thesis of why weighted opportunity matters and you picked the one player that i'm now going to argue <laughs> against myself with so yeah i love it i mean yeah I'm, I'm a raiders fan uh and so 2022 was was a huge year for me and going into the fishbowl last year uh i was so all in so hard on Josh Jacobs and then he turned out the year that he had now he's going to a different situation in Green Bay so when a when a, a player has a situation like that where um he blows everybody out of the water one year and it's not based on efficiency stats it's based purely on volume then he kind of breaks down the next year then changes teams are we looking at Aaron Jones usage stats last year to kind of predict where Josh Jacobs is going to land or how how would you how would you deal with that? Sure. So I, I wouldn't start from Aaron Jones. I, I would start with where Jacobs is coming from in terms of this season that he's coming off of. So over the past decade or so, there have only been a handful of running backs who got really like a lead back workload, 15 or more weighted opportunities per game, but also underperformed those weighted opportunities by two or more fantasy points per game. Uh, and Josh Jacobs was the fourth least efficient running back against his weighted opportunity of the past decade. So when you look at that group of guys, the fact is almost all of them saw less volume in the following season. And it makes sense. If teams see a player is incredibly inefficient to the point where he, he's leaving all of this production on the field, but number one, they might move on from him, which is what the Raiders did. Damian Pierce. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we we can talk Damian Pierce after if you'd like, but yes. Um, so yeah, yeah, the Raiders, number one, moved on from Jacobs. And number two, now he's on the Packers. We're not starting from Aaron Jones's volume last year, but we should start from how do the Packers view Josh Jacobs? So the contract, it is really like a one or two year deal with a team option. It's There's not significant guaranteed money after year one. Uh, the Packers historically have always brought in multiple running backs. They absolutely love drafting running backs on day two. They drafted another one on day two this year, who I think is very good. And <clears throat> of course, they have historically liked to deploy a committee. Matt LaFleur was in the media yesterday saying basically that, that they want to run multiple guys, that Marshawn Lloyd is going to get immediate touches and AJ Dillon can always come in here and make everybody really mad. So yeah, I, I so while Josh Jacobs had a lot of weighted opportunities last year based on how inefficient he was, based on him changing teams, and based on what we know about what this offensive coaching staff likes to do, I would project Jacobs to not be anything close to a bell cow this year. I've sold off all my shares in Dynasty. I don't want to draft him even in redraft right now. We'll we'll see if he falls to like round five or six, and we'll talk about it then. I'm burning wow. my jersey. All right. I got a question then, because we're going to talk about the other end of that spectrum. Okay, so... The differential, so we've got Kyron Williams, a guy that was, you know, 2.2 points above 
his differential. Okay. And now he's going into a situation in his third year. Blake Corum is a situation, you know, he hasn't shown us anything on the field. His efficiency metrics have been there for Kyron Williams. Like, what is your take on that backfield now with the draft capital that they've invested in Kyra and Blake Corum? How efficient Kyron Williams was and now all these variables. Because similar to how Josh Jacobs is, you know, he's in a situation now where uh, a younger back now he, – He's got better draft capital now is entering a situation. And, uh, you know, for for our fantasy managers out there that are looking at this metric and seeing Kyron Williams as being super efficient, how are we dealing with him in, in 2024? Yeah, so first I'll say I just looking at Kyron Williams, yes, he had a plus 2.2 differential above his weighted opportunity. He was efficient. Uh, I don't think Kyron Williams has earned the status of where we look at that and say, okay, well, you're probably a really good player that will always outperform your weighted opportunity. I don't think we're there with Kyron Williams yet. That That's reserved for like Christian McCaffrey. Yes, of course, you're going to outperform your weighted opportunity. Kyron Williams, sure, would expect some regression to whatever the mean is for his weighted opportunity. But that's really the question is what is the volume breakdown going to be between Williams and between Corum? So I will say first, I, I think Sean McVay absolutely loves and is obsessed with Kyron Williams. <laughs> that got very clearly showed through it, throughout the entire year last year. Even listening to him talk now, he he's into Kyron Williams. He has I think, guys. Yes, he de- absolutely does. Yes, and he, especially at the running back position, he loves to use a bell cow in all situations because he doesn't want to tip the play by switching between like a grinder back and like a pass blocker back and a pass catching back. He, he likes to have one guy that can do everything adequately. And that is Kyron Williams. And that absolutely is Blake Corum. And I think that is why they were drawn to him and why they drafted him. Uh, So just thinking back to last year, there was that four game stretch where Kyron Williams was injured or was on IR or something. And they they literally brought Daryl Henderson off the street in order to not in order to lead whatever disgusting platoon of backs that was. You could tell McVay hated it the entire time. He doesn't want anything like that to happen again. So I do think Corum was drafted first and foremost as an insurance policy of we still want to have a guy that can do everything that our offense needs to and be on 80 to 90 percent of the snaps in order so that we can keep doing what we want if Kyron Williams gets hurt. I would say that Kyron Williams currently is appropriately priced for his median outcome, which I consider to be Corum gets a handful of drives a game. Williams opportunity share falls between like 60 to 70% rather than 90%. Uh, But there is also the chance Sean McVay, notably fickle and picky coach about the running backs he plays. There's a chance Cora messes something up in OTAs and he's just dead to Sean McVay for the the rest of the year after that. So I (laughs) don't hurt us here. We've got a lot of Blake Corum. (laughs) Okay. No. So, but so I, I'm, I, and this isn't to talk down on Corum as a dynasty no, 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 asset or it's as a fantasy. Like, pick. That's a scenario that is like is yeah. <laughs> I, you could say the same thing about Kyron Williams. Like so maybe he does something that like all of a sudden Corum is thrust out there and and he becomes McVeigh's guy. But um, the, <laughs> I, I you hurt you hurt my heart. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not not trying that's to okay, hurt you guys okay. here. That's but okay. yeah, just just trying to consider the range of outcomes here um, for Kyron Williams. If we say he's appropriately priced for his median projection, and we know that the upside is he's the second most valuable running back in fantasy because he gets a 90% snap share. If anything isn't working, how McVay wants it to with Corum, or if he literally just plans to use him only in case of a Williams injury, I think that's worth considering. So in Dynasty, I don't shoot for those outcomes as much, but I'll, I'll give a redraft take on this show. I do think Kyron Williams in the third round right now of like underdog best balls, I think that's a priority click because it's very hard to find the Christian McCaffrey RB1 overall level upside at the running back position, especially these days. And Williams is one of the few players that does still have that where you can close your eyes and imagine a scenario where last year essentially plays out all over again. 
All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Schultze back on to finish this out um, <clears throat> because I have a question, and that is um, explain us explain to us the path in which on which uh, Travis or Travis Etienne finishes his RB one go. Oh, go me? Ryan. No, okay. no, no, Ryan. Uh, oh, Ryan. I thought, oh, okay. oh, I thought. Oh, I thought that wasn't yeah. for me. Oh, okay. No, go, go, Ryan. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that Sorry, there I'm is just... one. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I'm not into ETN this year. I, I think that just listening to Doug Peterson talk about Tank Bigsby and knowing how absolutely dreadful Tank Bigsby was on the field last year just gives me bad vibes. ETN was used as this every down bell cow, Kyron Williams-esque bell cow for like a five or six game stretch kind of earlier in the season. And he kind of wore down. He picked up some minor injuries and they never did it again. That That is my assumption going forward that the Jaguars do not want to use ETN as a true every down bell cow. That means his RB1 upside is probably not existent. What say you, Schultz? I okay. I'm the diehard Jags fan. That's why. That's why they pulled you into this. <laughs> it was a trap. It was a trap all along. Yeah. Um, I I agree. I would say like 60, 70 percent with that. Except where I will jump off a little bit is part of ETN's downfall came a lot when Trevor got hurt. The teams and the defense started struggling. They got thrown into negative game script, game scripts like the last six, seven, eight weeks of the season. Um, so that hurt him a lot. As far as Tank goes, he was very abysmal this year, and you are so dead – or last year. But you're so dead on about Peterson and the staff continually talking about this dude, about giving him the ball. Um, opening game last season, he drops a couple passes that went for interceptions. He had some fumbles. Like, the struggles are real. And then the coaches have talked about, hey, maybe we didn't put him out enough to help him work through this. So, like, <laughs> you're you're dead on. that They're, like, they're trying to make fetch happen so damn hard to Tank Bigsby. And, you know, we'll see what happens. But to me, the ETN, the talent and the speed and the, the missed tackle ability, looseness, all that, yeah, I, it's just the talent on those things is still elite to me. Um, and I, I think he's, he's at least going to be a solid top eight guy. I think one thing I want to jump in here is that they, that the Jags have been very abysmal in the red zone the last two years, and they have to increase that. If, if Etienne wants to have any sort of opportunity to be that RB one overall, like they, they need to be a lot better in the red zone as a team in general. Yeah. Yes. All right. And they, finish... they, Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say they dropped um, their center from last year, who was terrible. Um, and then they brought in, oh, Mitch Morris from the Bills. So veteran presence upgraded from the weakest spot of the line and the dude on the line who is calling protections and trying to keep everyone organized. So I think if, you know, if that ripples down the offensive line, that's going to help a ton. All right. Um, I think you misspoke. Um, you you wanted to say Missouri legend Mitch Morse. Um, all right. As we finish up here, I bad. Ryan, <laughs> we're 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 gonna go position by position. The show notes that I sent you um, talked about top five in the positions. I'm gonna change it up a little bit. I'm calling an audible. All right. That's a that's a football term. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and and talk about at each position group two guys that were that ever that the fantasy community is too high on and two that we're not high on enough. So go, go ahead with quarterbacks. Who are two guys that, um, that everybody's kind of like overselling. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I'll go with CJ Stroud kind of by default here. I think CJ Stroud is amazing. I don't think it justifies his ADP, which it, Currently, depending who you ask, there are people trading Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen away for CJ Stroud. I, I'm just not there at all. I, I think he's great. I have a ton of him. Don't don't think he's that valuable. Uh, as far as another guy that is a bit overrated, uh, I, I would say specifically in startup drafts, I'm 
not really into getting Caleb Williams like at the end of the first round of a startup. Uh, I get it. Yes, generational quarterback prospect, et cetera, et cetera, is walking into a really, really good situation. But the opportunity cost there is a lot of other quarterbacks that we've already seen produce very well in the league who if they're if Caleb Williams had the career outcome of, I don't know, a Kyler Murray or a Justin Herbert or I even I won't say Jordan Love yet, but they, any guys like that would be pretty happy. So I, I'm not really willing to pay the iron price for Caleb Williams right now. Okay. So CJ Stroud and Caleb Williams. Now that that popped up a question in my brain. Um how often do does the fantasy community kind of steam up guys based on a season rather than and and kind of devalue guys who have like a career sustained success? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think every single year we get a quarterback who goes very far over their expected touchdown rate that it usually is mostly a pocket passer and we get way out over our skis on them. A couple years ago, it was Joe Burrow. Now it is CJ Stroud. And now you can get Joe Burrow cheaper than him, even though he has a much better track record of career production. So yeah, that that's kind of my thinking when I, I am giving that take. Um, so yeah, I, I guess you can say Joe Burrow is my, is my guy that we're underrating a little bit. So what, what, how do you, how do we, how do we account for that? How do we defend against that apart from reading fantasy points and um, following your guys' rankings and stuff? Like, could we just completely ignore you guys and then, and how do we, um... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how do I we mean, account for it? I would say it, I think it's helpful to look at ADP or your rankings or whatever it is and thought exercise yourself and say, okay, what would I have thought about this a year ago? What did I think about these players a year ago? What did I think about these players two years ago? And if you're finding that my opinion of this player has radically shifted based on one season, especially if it involved kind of, kind of an outlier season in terms of scoring or touchdowns or what have you, and you have trouble articulating what the difference is in terms of projection this year, between a CJ Stroud, between a Joe Burrow, between a Jordan Love, all talented passers with a lot of talented pass catchers on offenses we think are going to be high volume with play callers we like, then it, that's what should be tripping up your flags. If one guy is in, in best ball, if he's going three rounds higher, or if you're valuing him four quarterback spots higher in a dynasty startup. So that's a, a, uh, Jordan Love, Justin Herbert tweet. Um, okay, so Joe Joe Burrow, and who's another quarterback that we're undervaluing too much? Uh, it's Will Levis. I'm sorry. I hate defending Will Levis. I've been doing it <laughs> all offseason. Mayonnaise. Uh, yeah, but look, th this Titans offense is going to throw a lot more than people are expecting or than they seem to be used to. They brought Especially in... Especially to Traylon Burks, right? Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> yes, okay, yeah, good, yeah. Good. Ask ask uh, ask DeAndre Hopkins about that one. Uh, mm. But yeah, br bringing in Ridley, bringing in Boyd, drafting the tackle in the top ten. I think they are really investing in the passing game here. E even when Callahan gets asked about Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears the other day, he's all he talks about is, "Oh yeah, both of them are so good in the passing game. I'm so excited to get them matched up on linebackers. They can do such amazing things in space and catching the ball." He's he's thinking about how he's going to be throwing the ball when when he gets asked about his running backs. So, and and that is extremely extremely different from I think what people are used to with the Titans. So if Will Levis is any good, that's going to be awesome for fantasy. Even if he's not any good, uh, we, you can sell quarterbacks who are not any good that are getting there off of volume for first round rookie picks every single year. We that was a thing with Sam Howell for a while this year. So. I think just where Le Levis is going, the upside is very, very asymmetric compared to a lot of the guys around him at the quarterback position. Now, as a, as a huge fan of the film Tommy Boy, um, that name really, really um, is is a it's a Voldemort for me um, because of the Raiders 
Buccaneers Super Bowl and that whole family can just go away and not ever make me say Callahan ever again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um so wide receivers, two two wide receivers that were were uh overvaluing this season. Okay, yeah. Uh wide receivers, I think the Brandon Ayuk confidence is a little nuts. I'm not sure if it's driven by people thinking he's going to get traded to a higher volume passing attack. Look, that does I understand we've had a lot of star wide receivers get traded in the past five years and absolutely smash and do really well. That's not always the case just to get into a different passing game and immediately be amazing. I think I use great, but look, the, as we were talking about with the 49ers, they're just passing volume. They're catchable targets total as a team per game compared to their total receiving yards per game was an unbelievable outlier last year. I have a tweet about this in the last week or so, but you, I mean, you, you can see like catchable targets per game and team receiving yards per game, very well correlated. And then the 49ers are just like up in this like top right corner where it completely doesn't matter for them. You can say it's the Shanahan effect. Yes. I, you like elite yards per out run all of it. That's great. I just think, it is overwhelmingly likely you're getting similar production out of him as you are going to get from, I don't know, a Stefan Diggs or let's look down the rankings and Amari Cooper or a Christian Kirk to give guys that are closer to his age range. So yeah, I, I think Ayuk is a bit overvalued at the moment. Uh, aside from him, I kind of take issue with this Jordan Addison ADP. So I think every year we look, understandably, we get excited about year two wide receivers. We should, I'm the age curves guy. I, I totally get it. But I think we do this thing where we pick out a wide, a rookie wide receiver from last year, say, eh, let's look at like the second half of the season. This probably makes the most sense, right? Let's look at the second half Often this is the guy that scored a lot of touchdowns compared to his target share or his targets or his yards. This was Jahan Dotson the year before. It's Jordan Addison this year. Why he is going even up with someone like Zay Flowers or close to someone like DK Metcalf or Tank Dell, I, I just don't see it. I uh, just Yeah, kind of none of the stats were there. He ran the ninth most routes of any wide receiver in the league and was still kind of a fantasy football, nothing like low end wide receiver three. I just, just based on the efficiency, I don't see him being a much better player and having a big breakout. And he kind of has nowhere to go but down when it comes to route volume, um, especially with Cousins out of town. So, yeah, I, Jeff, Addison Jefferson would be a sell. Mm. Rookie mm -hmm. quarterback. Uh, all right. <laughs> How, uh, w w going back to Ayuk real quick, uh, Sunday is June 1st cut day. Um, there have been some, some, uh, talkies out there saying that Debo Samuel was possibly, um, a, a cut candidate for June 1st. Um, how does that, if, if they do something with, with Debo, how does that affect Ayuk's potential? I mean, it certainly helps it a lot in the short term, but I, I don't know how much I believe that. I'm pulling up his spot track as we speak to see if this makes any sense to me or if I can even wrap my head around this. Yeah, I, I mean, his contract gets continually more expensive, but you have to think Debo Samuel has trade value right now in the league. I, I would yeah. be very surprised if you were straight up cut. But yeah, no, it, it is entirely possible that one of these receivers gets moved before the season. I just... When, when we're talking about top 18 ranked dynasty wide receivers, that's just not a risk I generally like to take when there are so many alternatives that can provide similar production, but don't have this asymmetrical downside to their value if nothing happens. And that's kind of how I view both of these 49ers receivers. All right. How about two guys that we are selling short? Oh man. I mean, Amari Cooper, I've been talking up, on every show all off season. Uh, so he, when he was playing with Deshaun Watson, he was a wide receiver one by fantasy points per game. I believe he was top five in yards per out run uh, with Deshaun Watson. You don't even need to put in the insane Flacco games to make Amari Cooper look really freaking good. Uh, yeah. It just, 
and it just makes so much sense if I have a tweet a month ago or so basically putting together the catchable target rate from Watson and Flacco versus the platoon of XFL quarterback. I, I, or no, it's not XFL, the platoon of UFL level quarterbacks that he was playing with in the middle of the season that really just dragged down all of his rate stats. So I think Amari Cooper is super undervalued right now. I, I don't know that I expect anything great out of Deshaun Watson this year, but just base level competence and Amari Cooper ha has very little target competition that I think matters. So I'm all about him. Um, and then someone else that I think we're selling a little bit short. Uh, I'll, I'll go similar actually with Deontay Johnson. Uh, so we saw Adam Thielen playing with Bryce Young last year in the first half of the season, averaged over 17 fantasy points per game. He was a wide receiver one. Bryce Young can support a fantasy wide receiver one. Yeah. It is entirely possible. Thielen completely fell apart in the back end of the year. Makes sense. Older wide receiver. We see that happen a lot. But Johnson has always been a hyper target commander, top 20 in target share. I believe every single year he's been in the league. So I really like Deontay Johnson right now. The, Johnson and Cooper are like the unsexy wide receivers where you can get IUK level production for a multiple round discount in startup. So they're two guys that I'm really leaning into in terms of if I'm trying to add wide receiver production to my teams right now, that's where I'm looking first. I talked up Deontay a couple weeks ago on this program and uh, got some crap in the comments and laughed at the person. Anyway, um, all right, moving, let's go to running backs, two guys that we should, um, you know, not value so highly. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I would normally say Travis ETM, but I'm not going to pick on him because I, I <laughs> like we've already talked about him. Um, <clears throat> guys, we shouldn't value so highly. I I think the Saquon Barkley being like a top six, top seven dynasty running back is a little suspect to me. So really, not since his rookie season has he commanded like over 19 or 20 weighted opportunities per game. Like ha had a serious that I'm challenging for the RB1 overall league winning type of season. It's been a long time, and I I get that we probably should be excited about his rushing efficiency on this Eagles offense with Jalen Hurts, but that comes with just naturally with a mobile quarterback on average fewer targets in the passing game for running backs and fewer attempts at the goal line. The Eagles backfield didn't actually have significantly more rush attempts at it, inside the 10 yard line than the giants backfield did last year. It was more, but not significant. So I think we're dreaming a little bit about the Saquon Barkley upside and it only takes what at his age currently, it takes one kind of disappointing year for his dynasty value to plummet and for him to be, in the gross RB2 tier that nobody wants to touch right now. Um, and they lost Travis Kel or uh, Jason Kelsey, um, otherwise known as Schultze. Um, now, now you look like Leah Schreiber. Okay. Um, and they have Will Shipley. So, I mean, it's just, it's over for Saquon. Um, all right. Sorry. Okay. Who's, who's, who's next? Yeah. So next I would say James Cook. Um, and that's because from my understanding, he's currently valued as at least like a fringe kind of top 12, top 14 ish dynasty running back. Uh, I, I don't see that at all. I, I was a James Cook defender last year um, for redraft year two running back, whatever. Let's see what happens. I think they really do not want to give him anything close to a lead back true workload uh he he will never be the goal line back with josh allen i think ray davis is a really good fit to kind of step into that latavius murray role <laughs> which is funny to talk about the latavius murray role but it, with, yeah it it in a backfield with james cook there's gonna be a latavius murray role so that i think that kind of tells yeah. you everything right there um but yeah I, I don't know it's easy to pick on the running backs in dynasty and say i, I don't want anybody that is like running back seven through 20 because mm -hmm. it, it's just easy to have that take right now but it, those are the guys that stick out most to me in terms of who i'd be moving off of who i might even if i'm going to make like a lateral move to like a, a jonathan brooks or to an isaiah pacheco or someone like that especially if i can pick up draft capital 
moving off of Cook or Barkley to them, I'm pretty happy to do that. Oh, don't pander to the Chiefs jersey <laughs> behind. Um, so what about James Cook's receiving ability? Does that not add to his um, – does that not boost his points per per attempt volume? No, it, I mean, it It does for sure, yeah. But the kind of the issue with James Cook all throughout last year, I, I remember this uh, – from like be, being really grinding like the DFS stuff every single week is James Cook was you you could never project him for a spike week in DFS you can mm. and that's because you can't project him for any goal line work whatsoever okay. uh, and th- and that's a big problem to me it, even in Dynasty even outside of DFS and weekly stuff like I just am not interested in a running back like that my my kind of overall guiding philosophy in fantasy football is. If I'm drafting a running back, I want him to have a shot of being a top three, like league season defining running back. And I I can never talk myself into that with James Cook at this point. Well, it's interesting because I I was not big on him coming out as a rookie. And then after year one, I like there was a dip in his value last year. I bought the dip. He he did pretty well. Um, So who are two guys we're buying the. Like who are two guys that we're we're uh, we're undervaluing? Who are two dip guys? Uh sure. Yeah, it's it's as I as I said, hard to pick out running backs to buy right now. Ding, ding, but ding. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I I would go. I would actually go Ramondre Stevenson. Um, mm-hmm. so part of this goes back to weighted opportunity. Uh, his efficiency was well below his previous career average last season. Part of that's going to be injuries. Part of that's going to be the absolute joke excuse for an offense that the Patriots trotted out. Completely new quarterback, completely new offensive coaching staff. Ezekiel Elliott is gone. The running back they bring in is Antonio Gibson, who is not a good goal line back. I would not expect him to challenge Stevenson for goal line touches whatsoever. Uh, and and I think Stevenson is good. Like it, when if we're talking. Not that running back talent always super matters in fantasy football, but he is, if I'm comparing him kind of down in the depths to like the DeAndre Swifts and the Najee Harris's, I think just as a talent, he stacks up pretty well. If that's about where his price is going to be, I'm happy to buy into Stevenson. Um, aside from him, man, run, running back buys are just extremely, extremely difficult right now. Zemir I White, want Zamir White, Zamir White, Zamir White. Uh, I don't know on the Zamir White stuff. I just, yeah, if you're volume, on a bad volume. team and you don't catch passes and Dylan Lobby is going is to be the scat back, it, I, it's hard for me to get excited about the volume. Um, but, I mean, yeah, he, he's priced kind of fine. I'm, I'm not super offended by Zamir White or anything. Um, I'll go Tajay Spears, though. So, kind of, as I was talking about the Titans, I think they want to be a, a lot more upbeat, higher, uh, faster-paced, more throwing sounds like Callahan thinks Spears can really do that. It sounds like he thinks Pollard can do that as well. But Pollard is another one of these guys who was just so incredibly inefficient last season that he is in that Josh Jacobs category, like a bottom five efficiency season compared to his weighted opportunity over the past decade. Those guys almost always lose volume. So if I can bet on a Tony Pollard failure while betting on a year or two running back success, which we very often see year two breakouts at the running back position. Uh, I already said it's an offense I want to buy into. Yeah, I, I like Spears going very close to Pollard for what I can't really understand why they their dynasty values are so close together. I, I much prefer Spears. I really love that you said Dylan Lowby in, uh, instead of, <clears throat> saying like inferring that Alexander Madison was a threat. Does, does <laughs> oh yeah, no, I would never. You would, I would never come on this program and say that. Yeah. <laughs> also, Dylan Alby, uh, I am in negotiations with his agent to bring him on as a guest on the Undroppables in June. So hey, that'd be sick. Dil- that. Dylan yeah. Lowby, Dylan Lowby, New, New Hampshire's finest. I think the yeah, yeah the, the first NFL <laughs> player coming out of the University of New Hampshire and. <laughs> Certainly as long as I can remember. So that's pretty awesome. I saw a dude at the grocery store months and months ago, and he was wearing a UNH sweatshirt. And I said, oh, do you go to New Hampshire? He said, no, my sister does. And I said, you should look for, if you play fantasy football, 
you should look for Dylan Lowby. He's a small school guy who's coming out in the draft. And and then he went to my Raiders. It was so cool. And then I got a hold of his agent who was very amicable and was like, yeah, talk to us in June. And I was like, hell yeah. Hell That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. You guys have any questions for Ryan? Oh, man, Ryan, you've been so gracious with your time, an hour and 15 minutes. Hopefully we didn't take you out of too much of your life there, but uh, really appreciate your insight. Some really good insight here. Uh, our viewers are going to have some uh, really good stuff to bring back home and, uh, you know, dominate their dynasty leagues because uh, some of the stuff that you've come up with and you've helped us through today has been awesome. So why don't you tell everybody where they can find you, all your work, because we haven't really got too much into that. Uh, tell us where they can find your stuff. Yeah, no, first of all, thanks so much for having me, guys. Always happy to talk ball. You're you're not encroaching into my life. My life, my life is talking about nerdy fantasy football stuff. So ha happy to be here, of course. We we say uh, obscurist, not nerd. Yeah, <laughs> obscure. Okay, okay. I like I like that. Yeah, positive spin. Uh so you can find me on X at Ryan J underscore Heath. And then you can find all of my written work on fantasypoints.com. Uh, right now, I have mostly been working on a series called Statistically Significant, where I go through our Fantasy Points Data Suite product and pick out all of the most important, predictive, interesting stats that I can find, dive deep on them, talk about what it means for certain players going into 2024. Uh, so check that out if you're a stat geek. Also, highly, highly recommend the Fantasy Points Data Suite. If oh, yeah. You if you are interested at all in doing your own analysis, your own research on players, I the Fantasy Points Data Suite is the best tool on the market on the internet right now for all of that. The I can't even talk about everything we have in like 30 seconds, but with so many charted stats, first read target share, catchable targets, stuff that's not easy to find elsewhere. It is incredibly worth it. It makes my job so much easier to pull stats and talk about and write about all these players. So highly recommend it. Go check it out at data.fantasypoints.com. You have subscribers in the building right now. Um, yeah, and and you guys out there, go subscribe to Fantasy Points. It's some of the best content that's out there. Um, and this is coming from player profiler people. Um, so, so thank you so much for, for joining us, Ryan. Uh, we'll definitely like get, give you some invites if you want to do some mock drafting throughout the summer and stuff. Show everybody out there in Undroppables and Fantasy Football Plus land how big a shark you are. And win yourself some mocks because that's a thing. Um, all right. On behalf of everybody at the undroppables, everybody at fantasy football plus I have been bigs. You can find me at big boned FFB on the tweets. Find me at FF connect 99 on X. Uh, yeah. Give me a Schultz on Twitter, Twitter or X, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. You're, you're, you're kind of the middleman. TZY. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, comment, share, uh, all that stuff. Tell us how we're doing. And um, outro, 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 outro.